thank Scott for the introduction. Uh, I wanted to thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me to come here today. And uh, it's a really exciting conference. Um, and uh, when I heard that the, that the focus of today was, was going to be in your futures, um, I thought I'm just going to stick my foot way out there. And instead of talking about something that where I have a lot of answers, we're going to be asking a lot of questions, I'm talking about a, a relatively new project um, that I'm really excited about. And it's a little bit different than some of the things I worked on before. Um, and so the project is uh, in collaboration with Raj Rao, who you just heard from, and as well as Jeff Ogeman, who we heard from yesterday. Um, and uh, Raj and I are co-advising a graduate student, Nancy Wong. She's the, when the when she's the one that's actually doing a lot of the heavy lifting. And so when I say we, I mean Nancy, and she's doing all the work. Okay. So um, before I talk about the project, I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about where I start coming at from this problem, which is slightly different than where Raj is coming from. Um, so I worked on before on perceptual decision making, um, uh, similar to what, what Anne had talked about. Um, and so I spent a number of years developing a task um, we implemented in rodents, looking very detailed ways at perceptual decision making, especially when the decision, decision coming in is um, uncertain or noisy. And uh, we had built this really fancy, a very complicated um, behavior system and automated behavior training. And we're able to get the rodents to repeat this task over many tens and thousands of trials and many, many rats at the same time. We can do electrophysiology, we can do epigenetics, and uh, had done a lot of these really detailed studies. And this was a really fun project to work on. And I learned a lot as well as I hope others have continued to carry on this work. Um, but after this project, I started uh, thinking to myself that I really wanted to be asking a slightly different kind of a slightly different kind of problem that is complementary. Um, and so I'm going to be making an analogy here. So don't take this too seriously. That project, in my opinion, um, was was a particular way of of looking at um, behavior and what the brain works in quotation marks, whatever that means, right? Um, so we're going to be looking um, at a, a very small piece of a very well controlled behavior, and it has a lot of advantages, right? We know exactly what's going on. We have great control over the repetitions, over the stimulus, over the over the behaviors. Um, and it gives us a lot of great power to be able to control what's going on and interpret the neural activity that we're able to measure. And if we did this over many different kinds of tightly controlled experimental conditions, we end up with many of these very fine detailed descriptions of exactly what's going on in a particular, in a particular task. And I think this is uh, something that is going to continue to teach us a lot about uh, neural mechanisms as well as circuit level understanding of what's going on. And what I started thinking about was, well, if you start looking at this, does anyone see anything here? Does this look like anything to anyone? OK, you know, what I, you know where I'm going with this. Um, so what I'm suggesting as an analogy um, is that if you think about what I do as an organism and what the rat does and what the dog does on a daily basis, it's not sitting in a box listening to clicks. Um, and it's not doing any of these very uh, well-controlled tasks that we teach our animals and instruct our human subjects to do. And if we're able to look at, in a holistic way, not only what the brain does in a particular context, but what it does in a more naturalistic, ecologically relevant context, we might be able to see patterns that um, just are not are complementary to the kinds of patterns that we're seeing in these experiments. And so does anyone see now what the pattern is? Okay, so, so again, don't take this literally, it's just an analogy. And so this is sort of where I'm going. Um, so the project, um, people have done this before, right? So there's a, a, a great community, uh, especially among the functional MRI community, where they look at these um, naturalistic type um, behaviors, naturalistic type stimuli. So this, I'm just flashing on one particular example here, there's many others. A recent example um, where they looked at voxel-wise activity over um, the whole brain of what happens when the, the subject here is now listening to um, a couple of hours worth of naturalistic video um, audio. And they can then map word by word what is the, the activity over the whole brain. Um, and so this is great. And, um, but there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of different types of behavior that we might be interested in that are not accessible in this particular context. One, we can't really do truly long-term monitoring. We can only lie in the magnet, ma magnet for so long. Um, second thing is you can't, there's a whole class of behaviors that are not really accessible in this context. So for example, you can't do anything having to do with motion or um, interactions with humans in a relatively normal way. Like you can't look at them in the face and actually have a conversation with them. Um, and so there's this opportunity here for us 
to look at a set of ideas uh, and ask a set of questions, right? Like all, I'm at, all I'm doing here is asking a whole new set of questions um, and without a lot of answers yet. And, uh, and, and so, so there's a lot of studies of, um, for example, how do you pick up a coffee cup, right? So how do we do this traditionally? We do this by, let's say, I'm gonna get a, give a person a coffee cup, I'm gonna put some electrodes in their brain, I'm gonna say, pick up the coffee cup. I'm gonna pick it, pick it up again and do that as many times as I can get them to do it, and hopefully control as many of the external variables as possible so that they're doing it in a, as identical way as possible over and over and over again, right? And in that way, I can average away the noise and get a really good, good handle on exactly what's going on when I try to pick up this cup. But that's not what I really do, right? I wake up in the morning, I really need my coffee. I'm gonna go walk over, I'm gonna grab my coffee, I'm gonna grab the coffee, I'm gonna be talking to you at the same time, and I'm thinking about how my kids are doing at school that day. Right? So I'm doing all of those things, and I'm doing it not because I was instructed to pick up the coffee cup, because I want the coffee, and I really need the coffee. And this will be different if I'm actually having a coffee at night um, after a, a lovely meal. And so what is going on in your brain that supports the picking up the coffee cup in these different contexts, when you're feeling differently, and also if you're multitasking? And I think these are sorts of, the, these are sorts of questions that I'm getting to be really interested in. And uh, the project I'm telling you about today is perhaps a, a step in the right direction in terms of answering these types of questions that are complementary to the task-based um, type of knowledge that we're gaining um, from many of the people sitting here. So the data uh, looks like the following. Um, we have a pile of data that is task-free. So um, similar to um, what you've probably already heard about earlier in this conference, um, we are looking at a, a population of, um, of patients who are undergoing pre-surgical monitoring in the hospital. And they're there for um, several days, two weeks. Um, so we have recordings that are continuously monitoring the patient for at least seven days uh, with approximately 100 electrodes. These are ECOG surface electrodes. And at the same time, we are gathering um, video data and audio data, this is clinical monitoring. And so we have videos of what the patient is doing 24 seven. We have audio recordings of what is being said in the hospital room, both by the patient as well as other objects in the room that are making noise. Um, and we recently put in a uh, Kinect camera in the hospital room to give us a finer, a finer monitoring of, um, you know, you can more easily perhaps get access to what the uh, limb movements of the patient are in this context. Um, so far, we have 14 patients, um, and uh, there's a few more that are, that are coming in on a regular basis. And um, this generates a tremendous quantity of data um, at approximately 150 gigabytes per day. Um, that's after compression. And um, not only that, this is multimodal data. So this data comes, it's, it's, it's time stamp, so we know exactly how each mode, um, each stream of data corresponds to each other, but it's complex multimodal data. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the things that we are starting to ask is how can we actually use this particular data set to answer some of the questions that are perhaps not yet accessible with more controlled task-based ways of asking the question. Um, and so, the first problem is that, well, this is the reason we do experiments, right? We do an experiment, we actually know what's going on. In this data set, we have no idea what's going on, right? They're just sitting in the hospital room doing whatever it is they feel like doing for a couple of days. So if you imagine yourself laid up on the couch, and say you're, you sprained your ankle and you couldn't walk around or something, you're sitting on the couch for a couple of days, well, what do you do? You sleep, you eat, you talk to people, you watch TV, maybe you work on your laptop for a little while, read a book. Right? And, you, and you do whatever it is you do. These people receive absolutely no instructions on what to do. We're simply, just, we're simply watching what they do and looking at the corresponding brain activity. And so the first step in this type of analysis is that we need some ground truth labels. And uh, the tr traditional ways of doing this is uh, some, some version of uh, the mechanical Turk or hiring some college students to sit there for a long time trying to tell us what's going on. And people have done this to a, to a, to a limited extent. And the limiting factor here really is that it takes approximately five human minutes to label one minute of video. And this is not even very in-depth labeling. We're talking about are they moving, are they talking, who's talking, that kind of stuff, really simple stuff, right? And that takes way longer to label than it does to acquire the video, which means that in concept, it can never be scalable, right? This way of doing it, of hiring undergraduates, of, of, of somehow farming it out for people, it just, it just won't really work fast enough for the things we have to do, not to mention the expense of actually doing it this way. And so what we've done is uh, taken the first stab at using recent advances in computer vision and uh, language processing in order to provide 
uh, ground truth labels of what the person is actually doing without um, getting people to do it by hand. Um, like I said earlier, this is just the first stab at it. There's a lot that we can do, but we've, what we've been able to do so far is, let's say, let's just, what, what's the first thing you would do, right? Let's just break it down to, is the person moving or not moving? And is the person speaking or not speaking? That's it, so there's only three of these categories. What we've done here is, uh, what I'm gonna sit and plot here is a, I'm gonna call it the actogram, across a couple of people, and uh, each row is one 24-hour day, from 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. the next day. And uh, what you can see is that all of the white spaces um, is rest, and uh, yellow is movement, green is speech, and, um, and purple is when they're doing both, because you're moving when you're talking, oftentimes. So you can see that, roughly speaking, um, you can see some signatures of circadian rhythm in that the people, in general, stop moving and talking as much in the evening when they typically would be going to sleep. We can validate this as well. Um, of course, a lot of our ongoing work is uh, trying to do this, but a lot better. Um, not only getting access to what, if the person is moving or not as a binary variable, or um, how much they're moving in general in the frame, but also what their movements are, keeping track of the joint angles in their upper limb to try to figure out um, more detailed information about their behavior. Um, but uh, then what we're gonna do is take the ECOG data and do some feature engineering. So there's a wealth of information from human ECOG about um, different power spectral characteristics of, um, of these electrodes. And so what we're gonna do is uh, take this large data set, here I'm only showing a, a few tens of seconds of it, remember we have hours and hours and hours and hours of this stuff, and extract power spectral features of each of these electrodes and use those in order to do some hierarchical clustering to try to find some coherent patterns in this ECOG recording in an unsupervised way without injecting some prejudice in, into it of exactly what we're expecting to see. Um, and so if we do this, and we do this um, hierarchical clustering in the particular way that we've done it, um, what we can then do is take each of these clusters and look at they're when they're happening and correlate them with when we've detected motion in the video and we, when we've detected speech in the audio. And in this way, we've annotated each of these clusters with a label, right? So again, I know that there's a lot more that could be done here that's a lot more detailed and a lot more um, nuanced, but we have a framework where we can, in a completely unsupervised way, without injecting human prejudice or using humans to be able to generate these labels, find patterns in the ECOG data of this long-term naturalistic monitoring and then label each of those clusters with something that is reasonably interpretable. So what does this look like over time? So here's just one example of one patient in one day. Again, we're looking at 8 a.m. for one day to the 8 a.m. the following day. And what you can see is that here I'm plotting two particular clusters and they were labeled with rest and non-rest. And you can see here that uh, the, the person is normally in the non-rest state from the morning up until approximately, let's say 9.30 or 10 p.m. where they presumably went to sleep. And so the cluster switch, and now we have the rest cluster as opposed to the non-rest cluster that's labeled. And if you look closely here, there's another switch here. There's about a one hour where the two are, are switched. And if you look closely at the video, that corresponds to when the person looks like they've taken a nap. It's hard to confirm whether or not they were actually sleeping, but they certainly look like they were probably at least resting and taking a nap. We can look at finer levels of description um, by, by doing higher order, higher level hierarchical clustering. And you can see that we can break down label behavior into finer categories. So instead of just rest and non-rest, we can do movement and speech. And, um, and each of these are, 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 we are starting to validate them uh, with a tiny little bit of, uh, of human, -labeled, um, human labeled behaviors. Um, and so it's, uh, it's great to talk about all of this automated analysis, but at the end of the day, we really have to have some handle, like are we just making stuff up, right, or not. Um, so we did go ahead and uh, hired a couple of undergraduates to label a very small fraction of the video. Um, it took them a couple of months to label about 3% of the video, and so here I'm showing the validation results ev evaluated on those 3% of the, of the video, looking at the F1 scores, which is a, weight, a, weighted, a, a weighted sum of precision recall of the automated clustering analysis versus what the human said the person was actually doing. And you can see here, in terms of percentiles, overall we are, it's not perfect, but it's actually doing quite well and certainly well above chance. 
what does this look like? Um, on the other hand, um, is that we can look at these clusters and then use them to do a whole new type of functional brain mapping that is complementary to what is now done in clinical brain mapping. So typically what it's done now um, is that the person is instructed to do a task, right? So for example, this coffee mug reaching task that we were talking about. Um, and then you can then look over the brain activity of what's happening during the coffee reach task versus immediately beforehand and figure out, well, where it are the, the hand and arm reaching parts of motor cortex. We can do a similar complementary analysis, again, but not in a task-based way, just by monitoring the wealth of data that we have over these couple of days. And what you can see is that we, we can start to look at the clusters that we've identified by the clustering analysis projected back onto the surface of the brain where the electrodes were, as well as looking at the paraspectral features that were most prominent in these clusters. And we can see um, that the movement clusters have some correspondence to the hand arm portion of motor cortex, which is great. Um, and in addition, during speech, but not during movement, there's additional activation in the ST STG, which is again, consistent with what we think we know about the human brain. Now these results are not different that we know. So you can technically say, have we learned anything new here? No, we haven't. But I think this is actually really gratifying to me to be able to say that even though we've done a completely different type of analysis on data um, that is collected over days rather than in a very finely controlled experiment, we are able to get to something that is at least consistent with what we think we understand about the organization of uh, the human brain. Um, and we are working to improve this analysis as well as um, as well as uh, improving the clustering analysis, as well as improving the, de the decoder classifier building um, analysis. And so um, those are all things we're working on. And um, like I said, this is just the first stab at it. I would love to hear more from you um, about, um, if you have an idea of something that we, we would, uh, you would like us to try, then, then we'll, we should definitely talk more about that later. Um, and, uh, and I'll thank again my uh, collaborators in the project and the funding sources. Thank you. Yes, uh, so the question was about miniaturization of wearables and gathering even more data. Yes, we would love to have more data. And in fact, if you think about the logical extreme of this project, it's, it's somewhat scary and big brother-ish, right? We're talking about, um, you know those quad rotors that people use for, like if you're, if you're a professional skier and you want a video of you skiing, they make these quad rotors, they'll follow you down ski slopes. You can have that, right? So miniaturization, more wearables, more data, as well as you can imagine kind of out in the wild, there'll be instead of a clini clinical monitoring camera, it would be a quadro that just follows you around. Um, it's either very exciting or very scary. I haven't quite decided how I feel about it yet. Yeah, Anne? So yeah, really interesting talk. Um, and I, I agree that this current way of collecting data gives you a really different picture of naturalistic activity in a way that, that other kinds of paradigms of the sort that you have worked on don't. Um, but, but as I'm sure you know very well, there's also a lot of trade-offs, right? Um, and, and can yeah. you give us a sense of uh, what kind of question you think you can get at with this data set? I mean, are you thinking along the lines of the example that you gave, um, that, that there might be different, the same movement at different times or during different states um, that, that might differ in interesting ways? Absolutely. So, so Anne makes a Great point that uh, I'll just re-emphasize again. Um, this is a matter of trade-offs, right? This is, there's no way that we can get the same level of, let's say, neural, neuronal level descriptions and circuit type mechanisms in this analysis. One, we don't have the measurements, and, um, and, and, and two, we don't have the precision of being able to know exactly what's happening at every single millisecond. Um, and so there's a very much a trade-off, and I think the trade-off here is that we are able to ask complementary questions. Right. Um, so for example, if you know a really detailed level, what is the population or activity of the motor cortex doing a particular arm reach task? One question that I will be interested in asking is, well, is that, is that set of neural activity, is that the same if you are in task or out of task? Right? Is there some modulation by uh, time of day, mood, anything like that? And this is, to some extent, a data, data mining exercise. Um, the other thing that I'm really interested in is, uh, like I said a little bit, multitasking. Um, and you can study multitasking in a, in a controlled way simply by asking the subject or the animal to do multitasking. Um, but I think the question here is, is that the same 
if this is spontaneously generated behavior versus instructed behavior? And I think that's a question that we don't know the answer to until we, until we ask and look explicitly. And I think this is a type of data set that is particularly amenable for, for answering that type of question. Um, so there's definitely a lot of limitations to this type of, of analysis. Um, I, don't, I don't think this is something that is in lieu of doing experimental studies. Uh, I would never suggest that. Um, but I think this, is, like I said, is a complementary way of looking at it. And I, I think especially if we can look and gain from some of the circuit level analyses um, that, uh, that, that others, including yourself, have done, um, it might be actually a really nice way of um, building a, a multi-scale level analysis of what's going on. So if you can get a handle on what's going on at the neuronal level, and then also get a handle on what's going on um, at a, a more global level across cortex and a more naturalistic, naturalistic contexts, that might be a, a richer description of, of what's going on. So I very much would like to, to um, find a way of bridging those different levels of description. Um, and like I said, we are all trying to understand the brain, whatever that means, right? So I think there's different ways of looking at that. Thank you, uh, super fascinating. So I'm wondering if you think that the methods that you're developing here uh, or the, the, the tools that you're developing here are gonna be useful for non-invasive. So I'm thinking something like EEG, right? Because that seems to me like the, the ultimate end goal of trying to collect natural data would be to pop something like an EEG on and just have someone leave, go out and operate in the real world. Yeah. So I'm wondering That'd whether awesome. you think that these tools uh -huh. are going to be applicable within that realm. So. That's a great. That's a great question. I think definitely that is um, that is one dream that we all have, right? And I and I don't have a I don't have a great technical answer for it because I think to some extent um, the limitation there is just the the quality of the signal and the signal to noise ratio, and that's not something we have control over. It's physics, engineering. and engineering maybe. Um, um, I, I think that the general analytic framework here, there's no reason it doesn't apply in concept to EEG data. Whether or not we have the signal to noise ratio to be able to pick out the kinds of things that we're able to see in ECOG, I don't know. Um, we have tried to some extent. We have a couple of, actually more than a couple of patients. Um, we have a similar type data set, except instead of ECOG is EEG. And again, anecdotally, it's much much noisier, and we were not able to get this kind of results that I showed you with ECOG that we, that we just couldn't get it with EEG patients. Whether or not that's because you can't do it, I don't know. Uh, all I can say is that we kind of tried, and it hasn't worked yet. One more question down there. Great talk. So one of the uh, curses of uh, this type of naturalistic behaviors is the fact that there are going to be many things which are happening simultaneously. Yes. And uh, of course, that is one of the important elements as well as uh, getting at the elements of the interactions. Do you think that it would be feasible with the data, mm -hmm. uh, with the amount of data you have, to do some sort of decomposition for you to allow to be able to separate any of these streams? I know that you worked before on the form of the yeah. decomposition or That's things like this. Have you tried any of those to be able to see, do you have enough data to separate? That's a fantastic idea. Uh, and like I said, we just literally just started doing this type of analyses, um, and we haven't tried yet, but we're very interested to do it. Um, my gut feeling, um, and perhaps this is more of, a, more of a hope than a piece of evidence, is that because of the quantity and the duration of data we have, that we may be able to get a statistical handle on the type of analysis you're talking about. So I don't, I don't know yet, but we will definitely be, be trying in the near future. Well, Bing, thank you very much for your talk. Thanks. I appreciate it.